Welcome to today's webinar. This is the fourth in a series of webinars hosted by the National Collaborating Centre for Infectious Diseases on the topic of corrections as a public health setting for sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections. My name is Susie Taylor. I'm a project manager at NCCID, primarily focused on STBBIs, and I'll be your moderator. The National Collaborating Centre for Infectious Diseases is funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada to provide knowledge translation and evidence for use in public health planning and policy. We're hosted at the University of Manitoba, situated on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, Anishinawak, Dakota Oyate, Benesulin, and Anishinawak nations, in, and in the heart of the homeland of the Métis Nation. At NCCID, we strive to honour the lands and their original caretakers in our work, we acknowledge that we're on Treaty 1 land, and we recognize that this and other treaties have not been fully implemented as part of a process of colonization that benefits some while harming others. We're committed to working with our partners towards reconciliation. Before we begin, there's a few household items. Um, this event is recorded, and it will be available on the NCCID website later on. <clears throat> there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. And you can use the question and answer tab at the bottom of your screen to pose content related questions. We'll try to answer as many questions as time allows, but it is possible we may not get to all of them today. The chat function will be disabled except for the host and the panelists so that we can share resources with attendees. Um, and I'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Jennifer Van Gennep. Jennifer is the Executive Director of Action Hepatitis Canada, a pan-Canadian coalition of over 70 community-based organizations. Action Hepatitis Canada's mandate is to hold the government accountable to their commitment to eliminate viral hepatitis by 2030. Jennifer is an experienced advocate who approaches viral hepatitis elimination through a lens of social justice and health equity. Over to you, Jennifer. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks very much for um, having me here today to talk to you. It's exciting to be part of this panel and thank you, Susie, for the introduction. Um, these are our disclosures and our objectives for today's webinar. Uh, I'll just jump in, but um, this, is what, this is what we're gonna cover. So uh, this webinar is based on a report that we wrote at Action Hepatitis Canada. It was released on March 31st, and I know it was released on March 31st because the deadline I set for myself was the end of Q1, and we just made it. So this report was released on March 31st of 2022, and it is called Prison Health is Public Health, the Right to Hepatitis C Prevention, Diagnosis, and Care in Canada's Correctional Center Settings. And um, this was definitely a, a group project. Um, we did receive funding from Abzi and Gilead for this, um, but we, we are, as it says, um, there was great input. It was a definitely a group project. We had help from the BC Hepatitis Network, Kaput, the CUPS Clinic in Calgary, the HIV Legal Network, PASAN here in Toronto, and Unlocking the Gates in BC as well. And they helped connect us to several people who have um, lived experience of hepatitis C in correctional settings. And we relied heavily on their input um, through interviews as well. Um, we also, I, did, I want to acknowledge our reviewers, uh, Sophia Bartlett, Sandra Kehon Chu, Fiona and Nadine as well. Um, all, pretty much every paper we read on this topic was written by one of these <laughs> women. And uh, so we were very grateful that they agreed to review. Um, so when we took on this project, uh, sort of the context, I wanna share a little bit of context for it. Um, in 2021, we released a progress report for um, Canada's efforts on hepatitis C elimination in Canada. So provincially, and we, we wanted to include um, the provincial and federal corrections in that. And as you're probably aware, there are priority populations as laid out in the blueprint uh, for hepatitis C elimination efforts in Canada. And so our goal is in every other year, we will release a, uh, an update on the progress report and on the years in between, we will release a report that focuses on one of our priority populations. And so we chose 
um, people who are incarcerated as our first priority population to write a report about. We, as we were thinking about this, um, we decided that it needed to start from a rights-based approach. There was no other real way to, to, to do this. Um, we also wanted to think about the people who have hepatitis C in corrections as whole people. And keep in mind, for example, when we're talking about discharge, um, keeping in mind that several people who are being discharged from corrections don't have housing or maybe even shoes. And so um, keep our thoughts about hepatitis C kind of in the context of their, of their larger experience. And we definitely wanted to collect um, perspectives, lived experience perspectives through interviews. So that was sort of our basis. And then I want to also just kind of acknowledge my own positioning in, in this report and in this work. Um, I am a white settler on the territory that belongs to the Anishinaabe people here north of Toronto. And um, I have never had hepatitis and I have never been in prison. So I am acutely aware that my role in this work, specifically for this report, but also just for my work at Action Hepatitis Canada generally, is to create a platform um, for, for the lived experience of people who have hepatitis C, who, have, who are members of these priority populations, and also the people who do frontline facing work with them in community. Um, we are here to convene <laughs> their, their thoughts and opinions and recommendations, and then to amplify them. Um, and, and that is the posture with, with which I approach this work. And, and really everyone at Action Hepatitis Canada, this is, this is our approach to this work. So as for the report itself, um, we have, this is sort of the, the structure of it. We had an introduction about like, what is hepatitis and, and why do we care about uh, incarceration? So we'll get into that. Um, pages about the right to care and the intersectionality of the priority population. We wanted to outline the current state and then make some recommendations. We started with federal and provincial recommendations, but then we also developed sort of a set of overarching guidelines that we'll get into. Um, some bright spots, things that are going well that we would like to see replicated in other areas, and then our references. And, and throughout, um, wherever there's blue quote, text, um, blue quotes, that those are excerpts from the interviews with people with lived experience. So first of all, the right to care. We wanted to establish <laughs> that the United Nations standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners, also called the Nelson Mandela rules, really lay out the fact that um, healthcare and treatment inside our correction settings needs to be equivalent to what's available in the community. And if it's not, that's a human rights violation. Um, and that sort of sets a, a baseline for, for what we can expect from um, our governments, basically, um, what we can expect them to provide. One thing that has kind of come out of this work as we've been meeting with governments to, to discuss it is there are kind of two layers here. Well, I'm sure there's more than two layers, but there are two main layers. One is which is what is our obligation to people who are incarcerated? And then there's another layer that sort of, if we're looking at healthcare and corrections, um, more holistically as part of our public health approach to viral hepatitis and viral hepatitis elimination, what, what opportunities present themselves basically in corrections. And I put a little red star here beside this paragraph as we were reviewing it and going back and forth, um, multiple people had positioned corrections as an opportunity to access healthcare. And then some of our reviewers were saying, I know I've used this language myself in the past, but I'm no longer comfortable using this language. And um, so we had a really good conversation internally about what, how we even want to, how we even want to talk about it, because the reality is 
a lot of the people we were interviewing were saying, oh yeah, like being in corrections is a major opportunity for me to access healthcare because when I'm out in community, I don't have access to healthcare. So what we settled on is that many people who are incarcerated face unacceptable barriers to healthcare services. And while no one should ever have to be incarcerated to access their right to health care, for many, their incarceration may present an opportunity to access health services, including prevention, screening, early intervention, and treatment programs, and that this would help improve their individual and public health outcomes. So I just put a little star there because we did not, um, we did not come to that uh, paragraph lightly. Uh, is is what I wanted to kind of point out to you. And of course, it's also important to note that this is the baseline, um, the rights, the rights, the right to healthcare in in corrections that is equal to what's in the community is the baseline. But this is not an obligation that is consistently met in Canada. And we'll get into that more. So. The intersection of our priority populations, these are our priority populations, people who inject drugs, people who are incarcerated, Indigenous people, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, newcomers and immigrants. And then of course, our birth cohort, which is a little bit different, which is adults born between 1945 and 1975. And these are not a neat little pie chart <laughs> that, you can, that you can draw and put on a slide. Um, these intersect and overlap greatly. And specifically, when we're looking at people who are incarcerated, 50% of them report a history of drug use. More than 75% of people who inject drugs in Canada have a history of incarceration. And we're all very familiar um, with the overrepresentation of Indigenous people in incarceration. So specifically, these three priority populations overlap greatly within correctional settings. And what we have read Pretty much everything we've read suggests that um, not addressing hepatitis C in corrections correctly, um, without doing that, we will not be able to eliminate hepatitis C and meet our targets uh, of eliminating hepatitis, viral hepatitis generally, and hepatitis C specifically as a public health threat in Canada by 2030, which is our World Health Organization commitment. So when we look at the federal uh, corrections, so in case you're not aware, Correctional Service Canada runs the 43 federal prisons in Canada, including the healthcare for those, um, for the people in those settings. And H uh, hepatitis C testing is universally offered upon admission, and it is supposed to be available on demand as well, is what we're, we're told. And um, if someone is diagnosed with hepatitis C, then direct acting antiviral treatment should be available regardless of disease stage. There should be no restrictions on, on what is being offered to them. So it looks like in the federal settings, we are doing quite well actually on the testing and the treatment piece where the federal setting is falling down and could be a lot better is in the prevention. So this is where we talk about the needle exchange program pilot that was implemented in nine institutions. Uh, and there is a report that Correction Service Canada um, uh, commissioned themselves and outlines that the program is not working. And we'll get into the reasons for that a little bit on, a, on one of the com slides coming up, but it is not working very well. And there is one overdose prevention site pilot that's in Drumheller. Um, it's, it's still just at the one site as well. And although opioid agonist therapy is available in all institutions, many of them have substantial wait lists actually. And it's not universal eligibility. It's not super clear. Um, if you can start OAT in that setting or just if it's a maintenance program. So um, it, could be, it could be better around um, eligibility for that program. So our conclusion is that Correction Service Canada could be well positioned to achieve 
hepatitis C elimination in people incarcerated within federal correction institutions by 2030 with best practices such as universal hep screening and universal access to treatment. And there are some harm reduction services available. However, I think even since we wrote this report, we're seeing, um, we're seeing data out of Australia that shows even with a robust treatment and testing program, if you don't have the prevention piece and corrections, you could see up to a 30% reinfection rate uh, among people who, who use drugs and because of the sharing of equipment. So that just sort of underlines the importance of the needle exchange program. And I'm just gonna share, I'm gonna just read um, what EC from Alberta had to say. He said, it's like a McDonald's drive through whether that's the nurse, the doctor, they're not really giving you much time or it just seems like they're not really that concerned or interested. And I don't know if that has to do with the stigma around inmates that we're all criminals and we're all bad. Maybe their caseloads are just too much. I don't know, but when I would have an issue, I wasn't taken as seriously as I thought I should be. In provincial and territorial um, correction settings, these are run by the Ministry of Public Safety or the Solicitor General or the equivalent, depending on what it's called <clears throat> in, in any given province. And they're responsible for the corrections um, within their province or territory. And there are no prison needle and syringe programs in any of the provincial settings. And um, Universal screening is spotty. <laughs> um, some of them have opt-in, some of them have opt-out, some of them don't really offer it at all. Some of them offer it on demand, but um, people don't really know to ask. And then even though there are national and international recommendations to screen all people who are experiencing incarceration. So what we found was that the standard of healthcare is not available, the same standard of healthcare is not available in correctional centers as in the community in any province and significant disparities in hep C care exist across provincial correctional centers. So even within one province, it ranged, you may be able, some centers in that province might do testing and other ones not. Um, hep C elimination is unlikely to occur in the Canadian provincial and territorial prison systems in uh, 20, by 2030. There's a lot of work to be done in these settings uh, if we're gonna reach that goal. Here's just the little chart. And again, I put an asterisk because I wanted to highlight. So when it says offering universal hep C testing and it says 100%, that this is from a study um, that was done in 2018. And that doesn't mean that 100% of the people who are incarcerated are offered a test for hep C at admission. It means that 100% of the corrections centers in Alberta reported that they offer universal hep C screening. So it's just a, a little a small but significant <laughs> clarification to make there. Um, one of the things we wanted to, to measure was, is the Ministry of Health responsible for health care in your province? Um, so as you can see, some provinces yes, some provinces no, some provinces are making that transition currently. The, what we found in the studies was that we looked at was that when the Ministry of Health is responsible for healthcare and corrections, rather than, <clears throat> excuse me, rather than the Ministry of Justice being responsible for healthcare and corrections, it allowed for a better uh, continuity between community and in corrections, um, both of files and data but also, so like for follow-up, but also um, benefits like uh, being able to access treatment. Um, so, but then you would think that would be like one of the main benefits is that if it was, if a drug was listed on the provincial formulary and the Ministry of Health was in charge of um, health in corrections in that province, that there would be no access issues. However, what we're learning is even in Alberta um, and probably other provinces, but that's the first one where we, we've been able to really have this conversation is that even though the Ministry of Health is responsible for treatment and there are, um, the hep C treatment is on Alberta's formulary with no restrictions, that 
isn't the formulary that they're using in corrections. They have a separate um, arrangement in corrections. And so until just very recently, that meant that in corrections, you could only access hep C meds if you were um, F3 or F4. So very, very advanced liver disease. Um, so it was not equal access, even though that's supposed to be one of the benefits of, of having the Ministry of Health in charge of your healthcare in corrections. So we're having all those kinds of conversations um, with governments right now as a result of the report. So moving into our recommendations, our overarching guidelines, these are, these feel, um, I'm gonna just go ahead and say, they feel a little idealistic, but this is what we would like the approach to be generally um, when we're talking about healthcare in corrections. So the top one would be an equivalent standard of care to what is available in the community, including harm reduction services. This should be person-centered, trauma-informed, culturally safe, informed by people with lived experience and where available and applicable, it makes sense for some of these services to be run by peers. Um, and then we also, of course, made the recommendation here again about um, healthcare being moved to the Ministry of Health and also discharge planning. I think anybody who is paying attention in corrections knows discharge planning in general is um, a bit of a, an, an area where much improvement could be made, but um, specifically around hep C, what could that look like? But in the context of understanding the discharge in general is, is uh, not ideal. These are where our, recommend, our federal recommendations. So we made six federal recommendations and six for the provinces, but there are some overlaps. So we would really like to see um, prison needle syringe programs or prison needle exchange programs uh, across all correctional centers in the federal government and in the provincial government. This one shows up in both. With using a model with multiple distribution channels for accessibility and anonymity. And I have a slide about that, so I'll touch on that in a moment. We would like to see overdose prevention sites in all correctional centers. Uh, for, for OAT, we would like to see improved accessibility and acceptability um, with the language we settled on across all correctional center, center, yeah, centers. We'd like to review the, we'd like the government to review policies and implement training and education to promote health promotion and harm reduction, including hep C and other STBIs for both people who are incarcerated and staff. Uh, number five is about discharge planning to include linkages with community resources, including healthcare. And then six, this one is a federal recommendation, but not for a federal correction center. So this one is more towards um, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and we've shared it with them, to develop pan-Canadian guidelines for STBI testing that could then be applied in all correctional settings. So we don't actually have national SUBI testing or screening guidelines, but if we did, then we could point to them and say, you know, this is what exists in the community. This is what should be uh, implemented in the correctional setting. Just gives us a little bit more leverage around, around this testing piece. In the provinces and territories, uh, the first one is to transfer the healthcare responsibility to the Ministry of Health, where this hasn't been done. Again, um, accessibility and acceptability of OAT. Again, prison needle syringe programs. Um, here, we also suggested because federal has universal STBI testing, um, we suggested the provinces should also have universal STBI testing to everyone admitted in all correctional centers with informed consent within 72 hours of admission. And that feels like very specific language and it is. Um, from the studies, the best results were not right at admission. The best results were um, between 24 to 72 hours of admission. Um, offer treatment to everyone diagnosed with chronic hep C and a reflex referral to community-based supports with consent for continuity of care, regardless of length of stay. This one I'm gonna talk about in a, in a minute with BC, but this one we went back and forth on as well. Um, it is the right of someone who is in corrections to start 
treatment immediately if that's what they want. It is also possible that if someone is in short stay, and this is one of the, the challenges in the provincial and territorial um, facilities because people are there two years less a day. Federal is two years or more, so it's a longer stay. Um, provincial is two years less a day, but the average tends to be uh, measured in days, not weeks. Um, I was just speaking to Manitoba Corrections last week, and they said 80% of our people are on remand. They're here for less than a week. Um, we don't have access to them very long, and they're really not really even thinking about hep C while they're here. So it definitely, the shorter stay definitely creates some challenges. However, um, what so if someone wants to start their hep C treatment, they should be allowed to, that is their right. But it may be true that they decide in a conversation with their healthcare provider that what makes more sense for them is to be connected to a community resource and healthcare at discharge. So this idea of a reflex referral, we talk about reflex testing in HEP-C, we talk about um, if you have a positive antibody test, the lab will automatically or reflexively test for an RNA to confirm that it is a chronic infection. Um, so we've used that language again here for a reflex referral to community and always with consent. We are always assuming consent. We had a really good conversation about opt-in and opt-out and where we landed was that yes, you will get more tests done if it is opt out, but there is a power dynamic at play in corrections that needs to be considered. And so what we are recommending is that a full panel of STBDI tests, Hep C included, um, is offered universally to everyone and that that is done with informed consent. And then of course, improving discharge planning to include linkage with community resources, including healthcare. So lots of overlaps between um, the federal and the provincial uh, recommendations, but trying to recognize the unique challenges and the unique opportunities to present themselves in each setting. Briefly about the prison needle exchange program or the prison needle syringe program, um, they're referred to as both, but Correctional Services Canada has called their pilot a provincial needle exchange program. There are some barriers to participation in the one that is currently in place. Um, even though it's been rolled out in nine centers for I think about four years, when this report was done, it was checking in on the efficacy of the program. There were only 42 people in the whole country enrolled in a prison needle exchange program. And it was determined that one of the main barriers is the inclusion of the guards in, in that process. Um, there was a lack of anonym, anonymity, <laughs> sort of the hard one for me, I don't know why. And then um, what they were hearing was negative and stigmatizing remarks from correctional staff. And there was a tension between the security and the health aspects of the program. Um, from my understanding, to enroll in the program, you had to have an interview with the warden, which in and of itself is enough of a reason for most people to just not even pursue, pursue the program. So luckily we have evidence-based alternatives from like 60 different <laughs> programs that have been operating all around the world for decades. So um, those include distribution from dispensing machines, uh, what we're seeing in community cropping up more and more too, just vending machines um, where people have some anonymity and high accessibility and they can be placed in places where there isn't a lot of surveillance. We have seen distribution by trained peers, again, high accessibility and anonymity from prison staff, and it allows for information and education. Um, distribution by community groups coming in, again, a high anonymity, and <laughs> anonymity with prison staff, but it also has the benefit of um, off being able to offer counseling and um, 
correct information. And um, it, it also helps with that continuity of care if, if the connection is made um, while the person is in correction, in a correction setting, when they're moving out, if they're already connected with the community based program um, for harm reduction distribution, then, then that helps with that connection afterwards. Um, and then there is the option of distribution by prison health services. This also allows a high level of counseling, but it does, it is slightly limited accessibility. So with all of these models, there's a trade-off around accessibility and anonymity and your ability to provide counseling and um, connections. So um, a lot of the programs that we were looking at worldwide offer some kind of combination of these. So um, lots of examples if Correction Service Canada wants to improve their program. And so we have our recommendation to them in the report. And also um, we just submitted a pre-budget submission to the federal government last week. Um, our recommendation is find a model that promotes anonymity and removes some of these barriers and get the model right in the nine settings and then roll it out to all 43 across the country. For our bright spot, um, we highlighted a successful prison needle syringe program in Switzerland. This is one where um, universal opt-in at entry, a nurse meets with the nurse who runs the needle syringe program, meets with people and the program is explained. If they want to opt in, they can. And then uh, it uses a dispensing machine. So this quote is from Steve. In Ontario, Steve is a bit of a icon around here. Steve sued the federal government, um, and that is why we have a prison needle syringe program pilot, even even as it exists, even though it's not ideal. He's the reason we have one because he took the government to court because he got Hep C in prison. So he says about needles in prison, we need them. This would have never happened to me if they were available and easy to get. It didn't need to happen. It was totally preventable. If there had been clean needles available, I wouldn't have gotten Hep C in prison. There are already drugs in prison. This doesn't encourage anything. And then finally, um, kind of a new bright spot in BC. As we were preparing this report, um, BC was releasing their, uh, or a group in BC, it wasn't, from the BC government, but a group in BC was releasing their reports and recommendations. And this has been, this is being trialed in BC now. It's a result of about two years of work with people with lived experience in BC and Sophia Bartlett, Dr. Sophia Bartlett is a, a large piece of this. And I think that you might've already had a webinar about this program, so I won't belabor it, but the idea is everyone gets offered um, an STBBI test about 72 within 72 hours of when they were admitted and everyone who is diagnosed that that reflex referral to community is made and then they have this conversation that I was talking about earlier where if the timing is right for you to start now and then continue uh, after your discharge for your treat for your treatment then that's what we do and if you decide that you want to wait uh, until you get back out into community to start your treatment. And that's also fine. And, and that connection is made for you. And then they coordinate very closely with Unlocking the Gates, which is a member, Unlocking the Gates is amazing. <laughs> I just met them last week in real life in, in Vancouver, met Pam last week in real life in Vancouver, but, um, we, we've been connected with them for a while and they had a, a lot of input into this report and they uh, are a network really supporting people across BC when they're released from corrections. And it's really just a fantastic um, peer support that they are able to offer. So, yeah, so we wrote the report and then it's a tool. The report is a tool for us to start conversations with governments. 
So we've done a couple of webinars um, and we have a small digital campaign. We're really only on Twitter. So <laughs> it's a small campaign on Twitter. Um, we kind of ramped it up around Prisoner Justice Day, which was August 10th. And on August 10th as well, we sent the report and a meeting request to all provincial and territorial governments. So those meetings are just sort of starting now. I don't know how often you've tried to get a meeting with the government, but um, we're just sort of getting those going now. A couple of them had to be postponed. Uh, we've had one or two in, in provinces out west. So uh, just starting that conversation, but it's really about holding governments accountable and just sort of letting people know letting them know that we're watching and we're paying attention and we're aware of their rights and obligations. But we also have some thoughts about how, and some recommendations around how they could improve and, and make it part of their public health approach uh, overall. Um, what would I add? We've also had some, some good meetings with the federal government too, because one of the, mm, I think it's one of the frustrations, I think that's fair to say, one of the frustrations federally is the, with Correction Service Canada, they're not um, particularly forthcoming with their data. So we actually don't know if they're doing an amazing job or not because they, they won't share their data very, very, very uh, freely and make it public. So that's a conversation we've been having is, you know, can, can we not even us, but will you will you share it with some of these expert physicians and researchers so that so that we can start to have some data and start to see um, where the gaps are and and how we can improve uh, healthcare for people with Hep C in federal corrections. And it was interesting, actually. Even even we happened to have a conversation with. Um, She's the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Justice. Her name is Pam, MP Pam Damoff. And we met her in Ottawa at our at one of our events. And she's like, oh, but we're doing a really good job on Hep C and federal, right? And we're like, well, yes, I'm testing and treatment. You're, we think you're doing quite well. <clears throat> but harm reduction, let's have a chat. And so we were able to have a good conversation with her around um, harm reduction. And she was able to make some connections for us to have, have good meetings. So all that to say, there are some good conversations happening and, and we're hoping to see some progress um, in improving the right to hep C prevention and testing and treatment in correctional settings. Um, and, and to be clear, I set up the meetings, but it's always all the member organizations from that province whenever we're having a meeting we're always including all the member organizations from that province and they're really leading the meeting with what they're seeing and, and what, um, what their experience is and, and, and what their, yeah, basically what their experience is in trying to help clients uh, access care. So I think that's, that's it for my presentation, um, but I'm happy to answer questions that's my information there and I think we're putting in the chat if we haven't already the link to the page on our website where this report can be found and like the little summary about it it's also available on the report is not in French but the page is available in French uh, if that's of interest that sort of highlights highlights um, a lot of what I what I talked about today so yeah Thanks very much, Jennifer. Thanks, so uh, we can begin questions now. So if uh, if you have any, please use the question and answer tab to pose questions. Um, <clears throat> I did have one come in uh, directly to me, which I just wanted to share with you, which was, uh, did you come across Crystal Matthews? And are there recommendations that might be specific to programs for people who inject drugs and use meth? Yeah, thank you for that. We didn't um no we didn't talk a lot about what that might look like um we're aware of the uh a trend i guess towards different kinds of, of drug use um and that it's not always 
injection and that it's sometimes it's inhalation and that it's, you know, lots of things. Um, and we're still, we're kind of monitoring, I guess, to see if the, if the recommendations change about what kind of harm reduction is provided. But at this time, uh, the recommendations still support um, needle and syringe programs. Great. Thanks. Um, one question that I had actually, um, you had, you've talked a bit about the kind of peer to peer, uh, you know, distribution programs or education and other kind of support programs. Um, one of the things that I've been wondering about is how, um, how to effectively put those kind of programs into place in these provincial and territorial settings where there's such a quick turnover for uh, people who are in the system. And so I wanted to get your thoughts on that. That's a really excellent <laughs> point. So I think that those, the peer-to-peer -peer distribution is almost certainly more suited to a federal um, setting where it is more long-term. I suppose there would be instances where someone is actually staying almost two years in a provincial setting where that might might make sense, but you raise a good point that I did not um, mention, which is that that particular form of distribution uh, among people who are incarcerated, peers, like not peers from community groups outside, but peers that are actually um, in, in the same correctional setting, that is definitely more suited to a long-term stay. Okay. Any other questions? Just gonna wait for a second to see if any come in. Um, one, uh, one last question that I had actually was, again, um, just looking at kind of the, uh, the need for guidelines and standards on STBBIs and corrections. Um, you, you had talked a bit about the issues getting data, um, and that's something that we've seen as well in kind of the research that we've done in, in corrections. Um, and I'm wondering about uh, if you have any kind of recommendations in terms of data collection itself, like what kind of guidelines and standards should be put in place for that? That's a good question. And we didn't really get into that so much. Um, more our request has been, to be honest, to let Dr. Cronfley <laughs> see what they're doing <laughs> um, because she's really, you know, one of the experts. So rather than, oh, sorry, my son's home. I don't know if you can hear that, but um, one of the, our, our, our ask has really been, can you please ask Correction Service Canada to share with Dr. Nadine Cronfley what you're doing and then and, and the response from the Minister of Justice was, yes, I will definitely ask them to do that. And I will also ask them to recognize that she's an expert in hepatitis C elimination in corrections and treat her as such um, so that it's not just us sharing our data with her, but also, you know, recognizing she, <laughs> she might have some good ideas and yeah. to take her advice on, on um, improving the program as well. So no, we didn't make recommendations about what kind of data to capture. Yeah. But we are looking, you know, we're 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 interested in treatment rates. We're interested in treatment starts. We're interested in, um, you know, the ratio of positive tests. Yeah. Uh, how many people were offered a test versus how many people took a test versus how many people were tested positive. Those yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's lots of interesting data. I think that could could be gathered there. Absolutely. Um, I um I had one more question come in here, which is uh, I'm glad to see that you've focused on public health. Uh, has there been a pushback about these being primary care services? No, not so far. <laughs> not so far. Um, interesting. So we had this conversation with Manitoba recent it's the most recent one um, around corrections and they they're the ones that said really it's public health like we're connected to public health and they're the ones that are coming in um, and just trying to think it's interesting that you say that 
that that is the question because even amongst even among the specialists that we talk, now I'm, I'm sure that there are specialists who disagree, but the specialists that are in this conversation with us, they all kind of seem to recognize that it's a public health approach, but it's um, specialists in, in many cases still delivering the service, but it is a public health approach. I don't know if that really answers the question. Sorry. Yeah, no, that does. Okay. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Great. Um, just checking to see if we have any more here. Uh, I'm not seeing any more questions at this time. So I, again, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today. It's of been course. a really interesting conversation. Oh, good. Thank you. Learning about, about a bit more about the report. I've already mm -hmm. had the chance to read it, of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's nice to, uh, nice to get to hear from you and learn a bit more. So. For everyone who's joined us today, please uh, complete the short webinar evaluation when you leave. It'll pop up as you close Zoom. Um, and links to the recording and the slides will be emailed to everyone who registered through Eventbrite. Um, it'll also be available on the NCCID website in the webcast section. Uh, thanks again. We really enjoyed the presentation. That's great. Thanks so much for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. <laughs>